If you don't know who this woman is when it comes to the study of martial arts, you might have been living under a rock. Because when it comes to the who's who in the martial arts world, she's a rock star. Sidagu, she's something different, all right? I wouldn't advise anyone to touch that woman right there. <laughs> she will leave you in stitches for sure. She'll put some shark gills on your neck. Sidagu, Dr. Odette Russell, was recently featured on the cover of the Masters of Martial Arts magazine as well as Nathan Ingram's The Deadly Art of Survival magazine. She is one of the most dangerous women on the planet. Also, not to mention being a Marshall Mays Modern Combatives alumnus. The Queen of Swam. She is the wife of Swam founder Sijo Abdul Malta Kabir. She is a Grand Master and founder of the Women's Division of Swam. Sidagu has many accomplishments, receiving a PhD in health psychology in 2018, being promoted to her ninth degree black belt in 2019 are some of her more recent ones. Although her martial arts journey officially started in 1971, it wasn't until she trained under her husband in 1980 that she considered herself to be a true martial artist. By 1998, she had formed her own female division of SWAM, Sister Warriors Against Madness. Along with thousands of hours of training, she also participated in semi-contact karate tournaments, kata, kumite division, and was very successful. Now, if most of this sounds familiar, it's because we went over this in season one. Like I said earlier, a modern combatives alumnus. In season one, we focused on Dr. Odette Russell in the sphere of women's self-protection, self-defense. Now in season two, we're focusing on the uniqueness of each grandmaster from SWAM. And Dr. Odette Russell Siragu is no exception. If you know her, you know that her knife fighting is insanely good. And she's one of the most deadly women in the United States, if not the most dangerous. So hell yeah, we needed to do it again. What was it like training in a male dominant industry such as the martial arts in the 1980s? <sighs> Rough, tough, but at the same time beautiful. My fellow um, martial art peers, the ones that I were in the dojo for hours and hours, sweated, bled, everything with, these brothers had my back. But at the same time, they pushed me beyond my limit. They did not take it easy with me. Now, my dojo was ran by my husband, who was the founder of Swan Martial Arts, C.J. Abdul Mutakabir. And he told the brothers, you know, make sure you bang her. And they pushed me. They pushed me. So, yeah, we sweat together. We bled together. And... Um, I remember the first time I got knocked out. I actually remember counting the stars. I think I got up to five before I woke back up. And I didn't lose any teeth, thank God. But um, yeah, I did get hurt. But it wasn't done intentionally. It was done to, to improve my skill set. It was done to make me the best of myself because I had to represent our flag when I would go to tournaments during the, um, during the time we would compete, which is normally on a Sunday. Now, when I did go to tournaments, that was my only interaction with other schools. And I did hear of situations where women 
were being objectified or actually sexually abused within their dojos, but there weren't that many schools that did that. Most of the schools that we interacted with were very, um, we were hard on their females, but were very respectful. And that was the case with me. In Swan Martial Arts Academy, the only female for, the, for that first decade of the 80s, I was pushed past my limit, but at the same time, I was safe. We use knives for many things. Wilderness survival, cooking, and maintenance, just to name a few. In the right hands, a knife is a deadly instrument, and when used correctly, it can be someone's worst nightmare. If you came across someone who is trained in knife fighting, my advice to you would be to run. If you do decide to stay, be prepared to be cut. Because yes, folks, you will be cut. In the martial arts, there are many knife fighting systems. Some are better than others. But one thing's for sure. Most martial arts systems have incorporated knife fighting and knife defense into the system. What are the important elements to training or practicing knives? Important elements to me is to respect the blade and to trust the blade. Once you have a really good understanding on how the blade works, there's a responsibility behind it. This can kill. This is not a game. And so as as that responsibility, you know, you don't play with it, you don't take it out, you don't fiddle with it, especially in public. You train in the dojo or you train at your in, in your private facility, but you do not take it out unless in the legitimate self-defense. Once you have an understanding on how the blade works, that it's an extension of your hand, that from the karambit is a claw and it could be used to grab and control. From the straight blade, it's like an extended finger. It could be used to trap, not just slice and, and stab, but also controlling the body through controlling apexes, which are the joints. <clears throat> you learn to trust it as well. So keep in mind that if you are, God forbid, in a knife situation where you're defending yourself a blade against a blade, that there's a possibility you will get cut. Just like a boxer understands there's a possibility he's going to get punched. But your goal is to try to control where you get cut, if you got to get cut, and you don't want to, <laughs> okay? Also know what the color of the blood looks like and how forceful is the flow for you to turn to determine how severe the cut is. Remember, when you when you work your knife skills, work your feet and your waist. Okay, that gives you a lot more power and get, takes you off the straight line. And if you're in close quarters, like in a car or in an elevator where you can't move your feet, then you use your waist with your hands. Okay, remember, respect and trust. If one were so inclined to imply that Sidagu is a knife fighting expert, she would make the correction and tell you that no, she is not. I don't consider myself a knife fighter. Actually, there's a lot about knife skills that I don't know. I am not an expert in knives. I am learning as much as I can learn. And I know that my blade needs to be sharpened. My skills need to be sharpened. But what I do know, I enjoy teaching my students who all happen to be females. And what's so interesting is our society deems that we are to be the primary cooks in our household. So most of our females that come to class really know how to use a knife. And I'm just sharpening their skills. And I have not met a student that does not like knife work. So I do have uh, drills that are created from our uh, founder, C.J. abdul Mataka Bear, and I've created some drills. And most important, I look at the scenarios of what goes on with attacks. There are a high level of t attacks against women with blades. And if we have a really good understanding on how the blades work, there's two things that's important for us when we are training blades is understand it to respect it and to trust it. 
So we're not going to be as intimidated when somebody has a knife. Of course, I highly recommend if you can get away, run away, run away. But if you can't, then you stand your ground and you'll be better prepared. And being prepared is where it's at. This is because in a time of crisis, Sidagu, like with all the grandmasters of Swam, understand you will fight the way you train. With this in mind, the ladies of Swam train diligently to be able to address all acts of habitual violence, with a knife and without. Yes, that's a hairbrush. What would be the main points that I would focus on in, fem in teaching females martial arts? And coming from a female, um, I would focus heavily on verbal defense. How can I get out of the situation without it getting physical? I would also focus on reading red flags. I think that's important. So what that is, is noticing a situation is about to occur before it occurs so I can remove myself from the, from the scenario. And then ground defense. Women should know how to defend themselves because a lot of fights end up on the ground, especially if he's trying to rape. And as he's throwing you on the ground, you need to know how to put people in um, locks, um, how to strike, how to not feel defeated if his weight is on top of you. Also, let's remind women that this person might not smell smell good. There might be body odor, bad breath. That shouldn't be a factor. If you have to defend yourself, you have to be 100% committed if you have no other choice. So um, Supreme, um, Supreme Grandmaster Moses Powell used to say, if I touch you, I got you. But what I like to say, if I distract you, I got you. So distraction is very important for us as women. Anything that works, I'm into it. So for instance, if you are attempting to attack me and then I'm like, ah, oh, thank God the cops are here. Thank you, cops. Thank you, cops. And you turned around. The minute you turn back around, you, you're you going to be greeted with my elbow. But then not, not right, right after you throw your eyes. You see, so I will not just hit you one time and not give you a chance to um to recuperate and then really get pissed off and really want to f me up i'm gonna go i'm gonna want to not kill you but make you very comfortable in the hospital <laughs> you see so that's what i like is the realisticness of of knowing what a what um this close quarter attack is going to feel like the lack of space lack of oxygen um, feeling off balance and feeling incredibly intimidated and still knowing that whether you take me to the ground, keep me on top, um, whether you um, are funky, um, whatever the situation is, I'm going home tonight. I would like to introduce myself once again. My name is Abdul Mutakabir. And the culture center that we have on Southern Boulevard, 107 Dash on Southern Boulevard, is called Swamp. It's an acronym that stands for the two instructors named that are the founders of that particular culture center, which means Sheldon Wilkins, Abdul Muta Kabir. That was the physical step that we first took in as far as developing uh, this name. It later on arrived into a stronger meaning in the community, which means strong, wise, achieving mind, strength, wisdom, alert mind, and maturity. The strength we're talking about first is spiritual strength. The strength to be able to protect our, ourselves against the diabolical satanic mentality, the mind that brings down man to the lowest of the low, 
The wisdom is the food for thought, the vitamin is the brain. These are the type of um, conversation we normally get in with each other in the culture center to be able to strengthen ourselves against the, the negativity that's outside of the doors of swamp. In order for us to be able, in order for us to be able to have strength and wisdom, we must be alert. The A in swamp means alert. In order for us to achieve anything in life, we must be alert. And man mean mind, and mind mean man. So that's basically what swamp means. So we say strength, wisdom, alert mind, strong, wise, achieving mind, and maturity. Because when you have those particular four forces with you, then you have to mature. Our main priority in swarm is discipline. Working with the youth is a pleasure to me. Discipline, I teach the children, means to be able to have the ability to take charge of one's mind, body, and spirit at all times. For we realize that our children today are our leaders tomorrow, so they're the most important part of our existence. We must remember that Sita Gu's martial journey really didn't take hold until she began training with her husband, one of the two founding members of SWAM, Sijo Abdul Malta Kabir. But one can't help but wonder, what was it like training with your husband? What are the benefits of living with your instructor? There are nothing but benefits. At first it was really hard because I get pushed past the limit, you know. Um, the teaching doesn't end after you leave the dojo. You go home, you're still training. Um, you're in the park for a romantic walk and it turns into a sticky hand session. Or you're trying to cook together and I'm cutting up vegetables with a knife and he's like, okay, come at me with the knife this way. And he wants to do a technique. So the training never ends. Um, we go to a club and we're dancing and next thing I know he's throwing hooks and I'm having to bob and weave and I'm like, yo, dude, this is not romantic. <laughs> but this is, this is our life and I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. The hard part is being his guinea pig when he's, he's trained. I've never seen him without an instructor, just like I've never seen him not train. And he would train under multiple systems, sometimes for decades. He would master the system. And when he come home from a training session, I was his guinea pig. He needed to figure things out. And, um, and that was, that would be hard because sometimes I would blur the systems. But I got better at it as I advanced to in rank. The most important part of living with my instructor is observing him evolve into this amazing master, senior master. And, um, and watching how he uses martial arts for all of life's scenarios, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He is incredibly wise and um, it's just nothing but a blessing. Well, I think it's very important that uh, martial arts is spread throughout the family. I mean, not just throughout your personal family. I believe that everyone should learn martial arts. I don't care what background you're in um, because it, there are these qualities that come with the art itself that you cannot gain from anywhere else. Like, look at it like this, right? We're talking about Bushido. All right, we're talking about that old way, that, that house of discipline on how one conducts themselves. Nowadays in most schools and most dojos, you don't see that much anymore. What I notice most of the time, um, I see people, you know, whether you're in an MMA gym, you just throw on your short shorts and you roll around and you do what you do, all right? There is no solid structure like you would find in a real dojo, a strong Japanese dojo, or even a, a Chinese dojo, or any, any school of learning in general. Um, those old methods have kind of gotten abandoned, they've been left to the side. So I believe martial arts is something as a pillar and it's important for you to know uh, to be able to save yourself, to be able to protect your loved ones, all right? And so for you to not be able to protect yourself, all right, being that, being that we're human and we're so frail, all right, and we're the only beings that don't have certain tools uh, within our flesh to be able to protect ourselves. All right, like cats got retractable claws. Uh, you got animals who have canines that can rip through flesh. All right, there's also this um, 
you know, we lost our grace as human beings as well, okay? Uh, we're animals and nothing respects us anymore because of how uh, low we have become, okay? So martial arts brings all of that together and it puts us on a high vibration, a high frequency, all right, to be able to protect ourselves, our loved ones, or anyone who needs help, all right? So look at it as a tool, a shield, a cloak of protection. Why not have that in your life? It's not taking anything away from you. It's just adding. Where most martial arts training consists of grueling days and nights of repetitive motions, sweat, blood, and tears, it is important that we acknowledge the spiritual side of the martial studies as well. But it is also just as important to know that it's not always about training. We have to remember it's about family, community, and the commitment to make this world a better place, not just for some, but for all. After all, with great power comes great responsibility. Token of our appreciation. We have you in all of our hearts. We carry you with us everywhere we go. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you. Peace be unto you. Thank you. Your soul have all the blessings that it could possibly hold. And we just say thank you. On the next episode of Modern Combatives, you've met all the Grand Masters of Swan. Now we meet the founder, the creator of the Fujiku Boxing System. Sijo Abdul Malta Kabir. Where all good things have to come to an end, this episode completes the invasion of Swam and lays the groundwork for our special documentary episode titled The Siege. That's where we learn there's a lot of truth to an urban legend, so you definitely don't want to miss it.